Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to a very special online event today. It's called New Frontiers in Music Medicine and Cymatic Science, Optimal Healing Frequencies for Slowing Aging, Decreasing Inflammation, and Pain, and Improving Cancer Prognosis. My name is Stephen Dine. I'm the founder and CEO of The Shift Network, and I am thrilled to be with you here, getting to explore the frontiers of what I think of as one of the most exciting fields in development, which all has to do with sound and music and how there are deep healing properties that really go beyond what we even think of conventionally and really can create a revolution in healthcare and well, human well-being. We're going to get to explore this with a remarkable pioneer and scientist. His name is John Stuart Reed. He's an acoustic scientist and he's the inventor of the cymoscope. He's also gotten to do some of the most groundbreaking research in the King's Chamber of in uh, Giza, and we'll hear about a lot of this today, but uh, you're in for a treat. So, John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Stephen, and uh, to be sharing on the subject that I, I love so much. Great. We're going to have, I know you've got so much cool stuff planned for us, since we have a little bit more of an extended event today. And I also want to let people know that we're going to have a chance to go much deeper in a, a new version of Explore the Secrets of Sonic Science and Cymatics, a, a program that really blew people's minds and really got rave reviews. So we're going to do a new version of that with John. So uh, more to come. And I also want to mention that we're going to have uh, two beautiful musicians who are going to help to enhance our experience and really demonstrate it, Anders and Kachina, that we'll be introducing a bit later. So, John, why don't you take us first a little bit to your backstory? I know that I've I've heard your the story, particularly of some of the work in the King's Chamber, it was so seminal in starting to understand this new paradigm of of how sound can really affect consciousness, our body, and healing. And I think it would be interesting to hear some of that backstory for folks who are new to your work. I'd love to. Thank you, Stephen. As many Shift Network members know, my career was originally that of an acoustics engineer. And it was in 1997 that I gained permission to conduct a cymatics experiment in Egypt's Great Pyramid, which actually turned out to be life changing for two reasons, which I'll come to in a moment. But three weeks before traveling out to Egypt, I injured my lower back quite badly, and it actually turned out to be a great gift. I was in huge pain as I entered the pyramid that day. But after setting up the experiment with assistance from the antiquities inspector, it involved exciting the sarcophagus with a small speaker and an electronic oscillator. And not only did the antiquities inspector and I witness a series of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs emerge in sand sprinkled on a membrane stretched across its open top, but I suddenly noticed that I was pain free. Only 20 minutes of sound had banished that pain when no amount of analgesics or I'd even been to a physiotherapist a couple of times, nothing had really touched that pain, but 20 minutes of sound in the King's Chamber had banished that pain. And actually in the moment, you know, when I was seeing those ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs pop out in the sand on that membrane, the thought that went through my mind was, it's quite analytical really, but you know, I was thinking, how on earth could this pain suddenly vanish? And so the thought that went through my mind was, ah, I know what this is. These are endorphins flowing in my bloodstream because I was so excited, you know, I mean, like who wouldn't be seeing these hieroglyphs popping out in sand on this ancient Egyptian sarcophagus. Uh, so I, you know, I just imagined in that moment that these were endorphins masking the pain essentially. And when I get back outside the pyramid and so on, the pain will come back. But of course the pain never did actually come back. Right. And that really got my attention. I thought, oh my goodness, how could that possibly be? So the two, the two aspects that really were life changing, that was one of them. Of course, I was pain free. And I wanted to know, I'm a very curious minded person, and I wanted to know how, how had sound simply banished that pain. The other aspect to this, of course, was the, the, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs in sand on the membrane. And what that said to me, Stephen, was, wow, this could be a new tool for science. And in fact, you know, that's exactly what happened in my life. You know, when I returned to the UK, so I 
immediately began making plans to sell that business to get into pure research, which I'd always wanted to do anyway, right? And, um, and, and what happened then was basically two different paths in my new career as a scientist. One, to understand the biological mechanisms by which that pain had sort, sort of magically or miraculously disappeared. And then the other thing was to develop a new type of scientific instrument that can make sound visible. And you see one right behind me now, the cymoscope instrument. Uh, is beautiful to behold, but it's also highly functional. And now there are many universities and private research uh, uh, institutes around the world using cymoscope instruments to, to study a whole range of scientific disciplines because basically sound underpins virtually every science. So that's in a kind of nutshell, Stephen, how, how I came into this particular sphere of activity in my life. Well, that story gives me chills because it's just it's so amazing to have that experience of both the miraculous healing and seeing this sort of mysterious phenomenon of, of sound made visible uh, in, in the form of hieroglyphs. So I was intrigued with your last statement there about just really how sound underpins so many sci scientific disciplines. And it's also really been central to a lot of our spiritual lineages and as well in the beginning was the word. And so maybe paint a little bit of picture from a scientific perspective, why sound sort of precedes so much of what we experience as reality. Uh, well, I'll certainly be glad to do that. And, and you know, in a few moments, I'll be sharing my screen and, you know, talking more about sound in relation to gravity and so many other aspects of healing and so on. But to answer your question right now, I think it's not it's not common knowledge that when we hold uh, when we have a thought or we hold an intention or even say a prayer that, that those uh, thoughts, intentions, prayers originate, of course, in the neurons of our brain. What, what is not so commonly known is that the neurons of the brain are actually creating biochemical reactions when we have those thoughts, intentions, or say a prayer, right? So at the biochemical level, the atoms and the molecules in the neurons from a physics perspective are actually creating sound. So this is, you know, one of the very strange things about, about science, Stephen, is that, that it's not really very cross-disciplinary. You know, most scientific disciplines are very compartmentalized, very separate. And so, you know, a neuroscience, a neuroscientist rather, would very rarely talk about the physics of sound, for example. And that's exactly what I'm referring to now that you know in neuroscience terms those thoughts are indeed creating sound in the neurons and by the way not only sound but also whenever you have sound from again from a physics perspective you have to have light light and sound are inextricably joined or linked right so every time there are collisions inelastic collisions between the molecules and the atoms in our, the neurons of our brain, then infrared light is created as well. And this light is modulated by those sounds, by those thoughts. So now we see a picture where the sounds that are being created by our thoughts, our intentions, our prayers are not just staying in our brain. In fact, they cascade throughout our whole organism. And similarly, you know, with other, other sciences, that basically almost every science at its root lies sound. It's, I know it's a strange, you know, concept to get your head around, but it's true, actually, you know, take chemistry as an example, every chemical reaction creates sound, you know, so anyway, it's a fascinating subject, obviously, and you can, you can see that I'm, I'm passionate about it, Stephen. I'm particularly intrigued by this, this notion of our, our body actually communicating through sound. We're so used to thinking of electrons and electrical impulses and, and to really think that the sound is more foundational. And maybe share a little bit about what are the, some of the health and wellness implications of that? Yeah, sure. You know, one of the really fascinating uh, discoveries that was made in 2005 by the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen um, is that the nerves of our body are primarily designed to conduct sound. 
this is really an astonishing discovery, right? And it, um, you know, I, I was even, you know, very, very surprised when I first read that paper in 2005. Uh, it was really um, significant discovery and many of the labs now around the world have actually confirmed the results. So what it means is that, you know, our body is covered in nociceptors under the, just under the skin. These are the free nerve endings of all the nerves in our body, thousands and thousands of the upon all over our skin. And, uh, and they're literally soaking up sound from the environment, whether that be, you know, a musical environment or, you know, some kind of a, a sound healing instrument, whatever it is, those nociceptors are soaking up the sound, passing the sounds through the nerves, right through into the spinal column, into all our organs and so on, and of course, ultimately into the brain. So you might think, well, you know, you, I was thought that that nerves were conducting electricity, right? Which is, of course, what everyone thought before the, this amazing discovery. But the reality is that the sound, you have to have sounds first in the nerves to create the electricity. So the electricity is actually created by the piezoelectric effect in our nerves. And so the sound comes first, then the electricity and then, of course, the brain uses the electricity, you know, for interpretation. So this is an amazing, you know, process that that all of the sounds that we are receiving from our environment and indeed from, you know, sound healing instruments and so on. This is one of the primary reasons why sound healing works, actually. So, yeah, it's it's pretty astonishing. Yeah, I mean, the way you describe it, it's like we're like a giant ear. So we have to work with sound if we want to harmonize our whole body. Absolutely. We are just like that, a giant ear. Well, right. well said. Well, I know, you, I know you've got a lot you want to share in your presentation. So why don't we dive into that? Sure, I'd love to. So, but just before I share my screen, I'd just like to say that, you know, one of the one of the purposes of this presentation is to share just a few glimpses into the course material and which obviously I'm hoping that you will find fascinating and enjoyable, regardless of whether you decide to ultimately, you know, join the course. So let me just go ahead now and share my screen. So new frontiers in music medicine and cymatic science. So this title and subtitle that you see here are actually superimposed on a lovely photograph, actually, of a cladney plate or a cyma plate, as I now call them. And, you know, for those of you who are familiar, of course, you'll know immediately that that is a pattern that's been created by sound. If you're not f so familiar with cladney plates or cyma plates, it's an astonishing fact that here we have a metal plate. Uh, you would think, you know, that a metal plate doesn't actually uh, can't deform, as it were, under the influence of sound, but indeed it does. When sound enters into this plate, literally the plate is imprinted with a very particular pattern related to the frequency um, that, you know, that's being injected into that plate. And so here is one particular uh, pattern that forms at a particular frequency. And a little bit later in the presentation, I will actually show you live a, uh, a an electromechanical cladney plate or cyma plate and i think you'll understand far more then so let me just now move on to my other first slide sounds role in creation so the prevailing scientific view regarding why the matter in the universe is not evenly distributed but instead we see galaxy clusters arranged and organized geometrical fashion in the heavens concerns what are referred to as baryonic acoustic oscillations <laughs> quite a quite a mouthful when the universe was very dense theory suggests that sound was the most most potent force even more so than gravity and this is very exciting research because it's showing us that even at the beginning of time, sound was the creative principle of the universe, working its magical power to structure matter just as it does today. Mark Whittle of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville reconstructed the sound of the early universe with data from the high resolution mapping spacecraft, NASA's WMAP, mapping the cosmic microwave background radiation 
the afterglow of the hot early universe. The result of it, this is the graph shown on the right here that you see compared with the piano keyboard. And then this is a, a beautiful quote from Professor Mark Whittle. The extraordinary truth is that we can see the sound waves exactly as they were just 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We see them imprinted on a glowing foggy wall caught frozen in motion. <laughs> I really love that quote. And if you look at the, the picture, the photograph actually above the, the graph and the piano keyboard, you'll see there literally geometric uh, organization in galaxy clusters. So each one of those, uh, those squares contains hundreds, possibly thousands of galaxies. These are galaxy clusters with huge voids between them and therefore in organized in this beautiful fashion by sound in the early universe. So moving on, regarding acoustic baryonic oscillations. So these are wrinkles in the density distribution of clusters of galaxies spread across the universe. And as the word acoustic suggests in simple terms, it's now mainstream science that sound structured the universe. This is really exciting. So due to astronomical observations that had shown that the universe appeared to be expanding, Georges Lemaitre, the famous Belgian priest and professor of physics, reasoned in the 1930s that there must have been a time when all the matter birthed from a single point, which he imagined as the primeval atom, a concept that appealed to scientists theorizing on the then new quantum theory of matter. Today, almost all scientists believe in the Big Bang theory of the universe, in which all of the matter emerged from what is now known as a singularity. And during the first 380,000 years, theory, <laughs> should say theory, coupled with the visual evidence of galactic clusters, suggests that there was an outward pressure caused by sound propagating through the dense matter and an inward gravitational force, which was also acting on the matter as the sphere of matter expanded. And you might think, well, how can you have sound in the vacuum of space? But the truth is that in those very early days of the universe, of course, it wasn't a vacuum at all. It was actually very, very dense matter. And this interplay of gravity and sound set up what are referred to as acoustic baryonic oscillations that spread outward in the form of sound bubbles. Yes, you heard it right. Sound bubbles carrying some of the matter with them, which is why today we see the remnants of these effects in the distribution of galactic clusters. And there on the right, you, you see Georges Lemaitre with his contemporary Albert Einstein. They were actually great friends. And of course, they collaborated and greatly respected each other's work. Moving on now to the exciting aspect of sound in relation to gravity. So also, again, on this subject of gravity, an important and groundbreaking study in 2019 showed that all sounds generate a gravitational force. This means that even the sound of our voice and the sound of music create tiny ripples that bathe ourselves, indicating that sound forms our biological relationship with the universe and it impacts our bodies through very subtle ripples in space-time. And there on the right, you see the paper, Gravitational Mass Carried by Sound Waves, a groundbreaking paper. And, you know, those of you who are uh, really interested in this subject, I definitely recommend that you obtain that paper and read it. But now let's talk a little bit about sonic anti-gravity. There were two famous scientists who noticed that sound exhibits an anti-gravity effect. On March the 9th, 1671, the English genius Robert Hooke, who was a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton, demonstrated that when a shallow dish containing flour was vibrated, it caused the flour to rise up the glass and run like a fluid over its side. And Hooke mentioned that the effect may suggest an, uh, an hypothesis for explaining the motion of gravity and that it may unlock the secrets of gravity. 
And in the early 1970s, the brilliant Swiss scientist Hans Jenny, in volume two of his book, Cymatics, discusses the influence of vibration on flowable substances, which he says can cause certain zones of the material to be held against the inclined plane and even move contrary to the force of gravity. So there you see two uh, famous scientists who both witnessed this sonic anti-gravity effect, indeed, just as I have. And uh, however, I think it's true to say that this is the first time in history, as far as I know anyway, um, that what, the demonstration that I'm about to share with you has been seen in public. So it's pretty exciting, actually. So let me just show you now first a still photo. Here's a still photo of that cymatics demonstration that you're about to witness. Also, just to mention before we perform the actual experiment, that this same creative force sound that we've been talking about in terms of organizing the early universe, and now its effects on literally on matter, how sound affects matter and gravity, how that can be used constructively for healing, which of course is the one of the main subjects that we're, we will be sharing today. So let's, let me now go ahead and actually perform the experiment for you. So what you're looking at now is this very simple apparatus. On the left there, you're seeing what we now call a Simer plate, used to be called a Cladney plate. And this Simer plate is going to be driven by sound and you're going to see patterns, cymatic patterns, emerge on that plate. And one of the things that I would like you to remember always, whenever you see patterns of this nature, of course you're going to be seeing, in this case, particulate matter um, that is going to take form from formlessness. So as the sound imprints on the matter, it's going to organize it into a beautiful coherent pattern. But whenever you see that, in this case, simple particulate matter, I'd like you to remember that actually sound always creates form from formlessness. So when sound, any sound frequencies, or indeed music, penetrate into your tissues of your body, then all the visceral fluids in your body are going to be imprinted and organized by those sound frequencies or by the music. Also, the other principle of cymatics, of course, is that Whenever you have a sound present and you have a membrane, um, then you will always have a cymatic pattern on that membrane, regardless of the scale. So the scale can be enormous, even on the scale of gal galactic clusters, or it can be microscopic realm, as I have shown in many experiments. So even the cells of your body have a membrane, of course, and on that membrane, then beautiful cymatic patterns will be imprinted whenever sound is present. So let me now just go ahead and turn on the equipment. I'm going to sprinkle onto the cymer plate. I often like to think, I'll think of this as sprinkling stars on the heavens. So here we have just, a, just pure salt, a simple uh, kitchen salt. And as you see, it's entirely random. But now I'm going to bring up at 500 hertz, thereabouts, I'm going to bring up some energy into the plate. So just watch what happens when I do that and sound enters into the plate. Now I'll just turn that down a little bit so that I can talk about it just for one moment to say now, interestingly, this is actually one of the patterns from the Roslyn Cubes. So those of you who are familiar with Roslyn Chapel, just south of Edinburgh in the UK, you will know that in the Lady Chapel, there are hundreds of these little carved cubes and each one has a cymatic pattern on it. And uh, my dear friends uh, and colleagues, Stuart and Thomas Mitchell, who are sadly no longer with us, they passed a few years ago, but they decoded those cubes, and this is one of the many patterns uh, that you will see now on those cubes. Now, what I'd like to do now is just to increase the sound level again, 
but this time I'm going to go up to 800 Hertz just to show you a different pattern that every every frequency basically creates its own unique pattern. Isn't that beautiful? Now what I'd like to do is to actually remove this Simer plate and to conduct this little experiment that I mentioned earlier there, which as far as I know has never ever been conducted in a public setting. So what I'm going to do is to take this parabolic dish and just place it again on the modal exciter like so. So what I'm going to do now is just to place a little bit of flour on the edge of this parabolic dish and you'll I think you know what's going to happen when I do that because obviously gravity is going to take hold of this flower. Just watch what happens when I add this flower to the quite steep sides of this dish. There, obviously, the flower has simply fallen down towards the center of the dish. Now let me just move that flower into the center, as you see there now, and add a little bit more flower. So now I'm just going to bring up the, this very low frequency energy again and just watch what happens to the flower. Wow, look, it's climbing up the wall. That's awesome. Yeah. And if I, if I add a little bit more energy, it's almost right at the top now of the incline. You see? Wow. And now it's going over the side, <laughs> just like Robert Hooke mentioned, you know. Wow, John, that is so cool to watch it climbing up the side like that. And and I really to understand that we're looking at the frontiers of science with this is fascinating as well. And it kind of makes me think a little bit about all this lore around these massive stones that you find in Egypt and Peru and how those ever got into place. and perhaps there's there's knowledge that's been lost of that that is based on this as well right you know i felt that you would mention you know something about levitating stones because you know it's pretty obvious here that we're we're seeing something phenomenal you know that the sound can actually cause matter to well in this case flower to flow uphill so clearly you know there is a discovery waiting to be made here and so here we're talking about you know, something that happened in, in terms of Robert Hooke, you know, hundreds of years ago, and yet no one to this day has actually figured out um, this relationship between sound, matter, and gravity. And, uh, you know, I find it absolutely fascinating and exciting, of course, because, well, I would really love to be, you know, that person who figures this out. And I do have this innate sense somehow, well, actually I had a dream uh, many years ago that that I was the person you know who figured out this relationship between sound matter and gravity so maybe maybe it will be you know but I, right now actually no one no one understands that relationship and so it's a it's a kind of delicious mystery waiting to be waiting to be solved Stephen wow that's just, that's the best of science when you're just leaning into the edge of the mystery like that that's so exciting Maybe you can paint a, pic, a bit more of a picture of how this, some of this work sort of takes shape just in the whole field of cymatics and some of what you're learning there. Sure, I'd love to. And, and um, I'd just like to, to talk about three, three topics, three fascinating and exciting topics actually in the field of sound healing, sound therapy, music medicine, and so on. This whole subject is so fascinating. It began actually around 2002 when Professor James Jimzuski at UCLA, he was the first person to listen in literally to the sounds of cells. And he used an instrument called atomic force 
microscopy, which basically it's it's like you know like the uh, old fashioned well <laughs> they're not so old fashioned now I'm talking about record players actually because they're coming back into style again but but anyway you know in the in the record player you have a stylus this little stylus that sits in the groove of the record well with AFM with atomic force microscopy it's very similar actually to that excepting that the stylus is actually microscopic you know you would really struggle to see it it is so so small so and that the tip of that little tiny microscopic stylus literally rests on a single cell and the membrane of the cell is respirating it's literally moving with all the metabolic processes that are going on inside the cell and this creates literally the song of the cell it's a it's not a single frequency it's a an array of multiple frequencies and uh, and james jimzuski listened in to the sound of cells and he and his colleague andrew pelling were the first people well actually they they coined this word sono cytology obviously the sound of cells uh, they were the first person to suggest that there may be here a method by which cancer cells could ultimately be eradicated which obviously that's a long time ago but still um, in the intervening years i have done some you know really interesting work with professor sung chul ji which I, i'll come on to in a moment uh, regarding cancer cells and healthy cells uh, all again inspired by jim professor jim zuski's work but but before that, just to mention that this whole idea of cells making uh, their own song, their own sounds, what happens is when a system of cells in the body is challenged by an invasion of a pathogen, for example, or perhaps some toxicity has been imbibed, or even a uh, physical trauma to the body some particular area of the body has been traumatized what can happen in that system of cells is that they literally go to sleep it's just like you know normal sleep you could say for a human excepting now we're talking about cells that are sleeping and when they're sleeping they're not actually making any sound they've, they've literally gone silent and this is called in medical terms it's called the g0 phase of the cell cycle now obviously one of the ways that cells can heal themselves is simply through time you know if you give them sufficient time most cells particularly if there if there are no toxic substances if the body has been you know detox for example um, or in the case of pathogens if there's been sufficient time for the body for the white blood cells to mop up the pathogens then eventually eventually those cells would come back online again but usually there's a kind of hysteresis involved a kind of quite a significant delay so people can be you know this system of cells that are that are not not uh, performing their normal function they're not replicating and so on that, that puts the whole body out of balance basically and so the person feels ill essentially well one of the ways that you can awaken these sleeping cells uh, i often think of it as you know the kind of the goldilocks zone but i the way i think of it is that if we immerse sleeping cells in an array of frequencies then they will simply absorb the frequencies that they need it's like a kind of sonic nutrition essentially they will absorb what they need and essentially not well they reject what they don't need that is provided the sound level is moderate it must be moderate and not you know not too loud and by moderate i'm talking about this goldilocks zone 70 to 85 decibels and for those of you who you know don't not familiar with those units these days it's really easy to buy an app for your phone that shows you the decibel levels, you know, when you're playing an instrument or, or whatever. So that's, you know, one aspect of sonocytology. Another one that was, you know, inspired by their work with, with cells is this idea that we can differentiate between the sounds made by cancer cells and healthy cells. And we can do that 
with cymatics. So cymatics technology comes into into play here in a in a very helpful, very useful way. So what it means is that a uh, again, inspired by James Jimzuski's work, that a cancer cell does not emit the same kind of sounds as a healthy cell. And this is what they predicted way back in 2002. And in much more recent times, Professor Sung Chil Ji and I have discovered exactly that, that cancer cells, well, their sound is definitely not harmonic. It's, it's really, you know, when you hear it, it's not pleasant on the ear. Um, and when you make those sounds, when we make those sounds visible with the cymoscope instrument, then the pattern, the cymatic pattern that's created is pretty ugly to, to behold, actually. Whereas, you know, when, when looking at the sound of a healthy cell and, and hearing the sound of a healthy cell, well, it's very symmetrical. It's, it's quite beautiful, actually, to behold. And so here we, we recognized immediately that here was a way to differentiate between cancer cells and healthy cells. And the first use of this that we are uh, predicting is a new tool for surgeons, actually, because when a surgeon has a, a person open and is removing a tumor, apparently it's not that easy to, to distinguish the margins of that tumor to know exactly where those margins lie in relation to the healthy tissue. So by having a, a new kind of instrument with, uh, with special eyewear in which is a little video camera, so the surgeon, he or she is seeing in real time these cymatic patterns, you know, whether scanning the laser across the tissues will then pick up the pattern that's created and the, the surgeon will be able to differentiate immediately where the, the, the margins of the tumor lie. So that's pretty exciting. But even more exciting than that, of course, is what uh, Professor Jim Zuski and Andrew Pelling uh, prophesized all those years ago. This, this technology could lead to total eradication of cancers, all cancers, not just tumors, but also blood cancers. And uh, I'll be talking in much more depth about that in the course itself. Wow, now, well, that's, that's, I mean, I just want to pause and say what an incredible statement that is, so that it's basically you can detect in a very specific way based upon frequencies, which, which are healthy cells and which are not, which allows you to differentiate them, it sounds. So that's, that's instead of another drug, it's a sonic approach that could potentially end cancer. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's a really exciting future that lies, lies ahead. You know, I, I lost my own my own beloved sister uh, to cancer, you know, just three years ago, and um, well, I, 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 so many people, you know, have lost loved ones to cancer, and it's really, in my view, in the future, you know, uh, medical uh, people will be looking back on these days and say, and with horror, basically, because the answers, actually, I believe, are extremely simple. And, um, you know, there are some wonderful tools already in use and being and being further developed, one of which is histotripsy. You've probably heard of that. Um, this is a way of using ultrasound. So this is very high frequency sound that is being um, directed into, for example, a tumor. That's very exciting. And of course, it's using sound. But, but the method that I'm referring to is not ultrasound. It is actually audible sound, and it's really exciting. And I, I would love to share more of that, obviously, in the, uh, in the course material, Stephen. Wow. I mean, it's just, I, I just see all these different threads coming together. Our whole body is an ear, and we can, we can sonically detect cancer. So it's like the harmonization of our body through sound is, is very, has a very real health benefit, it sounds like. Oh, it's going to be a, a really wonderful future that, that lies ahead for humanity, I have no doubt. There's another topic that I really would love to, to talk about briefly at any rate, and this concerns uh, my music blood experiments, again, in collaboration with Professor Sung Chul Ji of Rutgers University. And so many years ago, Stephen, you know, I had this hunch, it was, that's all it was, a kind of intuitive hunch, that music might affect 
the longevity of red blood cells. That, that was the idea that I had. These, these ideas, by the way, come to me very often when I'm lying in bed, you know, and I'm in that kind of theater state. And uh, anyway, it occurred to me in that way. And so then uh, three, three years, actually a little bit more than three years ago now, um, I reached out to uh, Professor Sung Chul Ji that I had met very briefly at a conference uh, in Bulgaria, a water conference actually. And uh, we had a conversation about this whole idea of how would we create a protocol, an experimental protocol to test this hypothesis that music might affect the longevity beneficially, obviously I was predicting. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, to cut a long story short, he came here literally you flew you know flew from uh from america to the uk we spent i don't know five days in the lab here designing this protocol and also after having designed the protocol to then carry out the very first experiments together and the first experiments Stephen, were with classical music right <laughs> because both professor g and i well we both kind of intuitively believed or thought let's say that classical music would actually provide the best result i think you know it's pretty common knowledge now that that experiment <clears throat> that someone conducted when they uh, played rock music to a plant that you know allegedly wilted and then they played classical music to the plant and the, the plant flourished you know right well uh, has anyone actually ever conducted that experiment, you know, with good controls? Because now I really don't believe that. Because that day when we first began experimenting, you know, with whole human blood and classical music, the results were pretty good. You know, we were getting some really nice returns, like, you know, 10% improvement in the viability of the red blood cells, which was, you know, pretty amazing. Uh, and we were very excited about it at the time. But then subsequently, when I went on to test pop music, right? Oh my goodness, the results were amazing, so much higher than classical music. And so this was really interesting and a little bit puzzling initially until Professor G and I figured out what was happening. And this is the, uh, the theory now that I'm going to share. Why is it that music gives us new red blood cells for old it's like the old story of the genie you know new lamps for old is what it reminds me of anyway um well what happens is this that in your body obviously we everyone has a heart and that the job of the heart you might think is entirely due to entirely focused on circulating the blood around the body and of course that is its primary role but it turns out that it has a, a secondary role as well. Actually, it has many roles, but this is another primary, you know, role, a secondary primary. <clears throat> and it is to cause oxygen binding. So the oxygen that's dissolved in our bloodstream, of course, is there because of respiration. So the little alveoli in our lungs, they are, you know, responsible for gas exchange from our lungs into our bloodstream. So uh, oxygen moves through into the bloodstream and the uh, waste product, the CO2, moves out and we ex excel, expel that, of course, when we breathe out. So now we see this picture where we have blood that's being circulated by the heart. It's engorged with oxygen. It's full of dissolved oxygen, basically. And, and how, does it get, how does it bind to the hemoglobin molecules? Well, it turns out that it binds because of sound. Every time your heart beats, that is a sonic pulse. It's a sound pulse, a low frequency energy. And that is the primary reason why the hemoglobin molecules absorb the sound. Well, I think you can see where I'm going now, Stephen, with this, because classical music actually has, well, relatively uh, low level bass content, you know, the, the bass register in classical music, unless you're talking about, you know, something like the, uh, the 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky, you know, which has got cannons and all of that. But usually with classical music, the bass register, you know, is fairly low level. 
most of the energy lies in the mid range and upper frequencies in classical music, but not so in popular music. All popular genres, uh, well, almost all popular genres have a throbbing bass beat. And it turns out that this bass beat is actually extremely healing. It's also, of course, why the drum as an instrument is extremely healing. These frequencies that are played to the body via, either via, you know, a speaker system, for example, if we we're talking about recorded music or live music or in the case of a drum, you know, or, or some other uh, traditional instrument that's providing low frequency pulses into our body, you can see now that that obviously assists in the absorption of oxygen, the binding of the oxygen to the hemoglobin. And then when you know that oxygen is the key ingredient, the key molecule in our body for healing, for almost every process in the body requires oxygen for healing, now you can see this, you know, wonderful correlation between music and healing straight away. You know, oxygen is being delivered. More oxygen is being delivered to the tissues, therefore more healing. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Wow. This is just blowing our minds, John. Thank you. Thank you for opening up these new uh, possibilities. I know you have a whole other segment you want to take us into as well here. And you want to lead us into that? So just a few more slides and then we're, we're going to be immersed in the beautiful music of Anders in Kachina. So with this slide, constructive sound therapy number one, I'm actually just referring here to uh, ultrasound, which I think it's pretty well known now The therapeutic ultrasound, which is simply high frequency sound, is deployed for support of soft tissue trauma and disturb bone fractures. You know, if you if you have a bone fracture and you do something silly when you have the cast on, you don't, you know, you're not taking care and you disturb that fracture. Well, without ultrasound, you might never have, you, you, that bone fracture might never heal, but ultrasound can actually help it to heal, right? So now ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasound is utilized in hospitals and sports injury clinics all over the world. And the sound frequencies used are very high, typically 1 million hertz, 2 million hertz, and 3 million hertz, depending on the depth of penetration required. So 1 million hertz, for example, 1 megahertz, uh, offers greater penetration, whereas 3 megahertz, for example, offers a, a more focused sound beam, which of course, in some circumstances, is very, very useful. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm mentioning now ultrasound is because, because it is so accepted in the mainstream in hospitals. And of course, it's only one small step, actually quite a big step, but one step uh, into audible sound, you know, into the mainstream, which is why to me, it's very exciting. Now, there are a couple of other devices that I'd like to mention here that are particularly important. This first one, is the Nova Fon. So Nova Sonic designed this actually way back in 1928. And it was the genesis of all modern audible sound therapy devices. And it's based on 50 Hertz frequencies and 100 Hertz sonic frequencies. And it was the brainchild of Professor Erwin Schliephaker, who was the designer of the original Nova Sonic device. And you know, one of the exciting aspects to this very simple and not terribly expensive device is that it can help so many different conditions and not only for humans, but for animals too. So there you see uh, for veterinary work for a dog or a horse or any other uh, creature. Um, and Annalise and I have actually seen this happening with dogs. And you might say, well, how does the dog know, you know, when it's had enough? And actually dogs do, they have an innate kind of intelligence and they literally walk away when they've had enough of the energy. But equally, if they really need it, they will s s literally sit there or stand there, you know, uh, while you're providing the, the, the low frequency sound. But so that's the kind of genesis of all um, modern sound therapy devices. But now let's look at a very important uh, present day device 
This is by Saima Technologies and it's called the AMI 850 sound therapy device. And there on the right hand side, Peter, Dr. Peter Guy Manners, a man, by the way, that I interviewed on two different occasions many years ago. Sadly, he's no longer with us now, but what an interesting man. And so acoustic meridian intelligence devices send sound into our entire body through our feet based on the ancient Egyptian system of reflexology, thereby innovating all of our organs with a wide range of sound frequencies, the same frequencies that our cells sing. You know, now thinking back to sonocytology and Dr. James Jimzuski's work, Anyway, in this case, the, the frequencies were identified through German research and were further developed by Dr. Peter Guy Manners in the UK. And the AMI devices deliver sound via the nervous system and the fascia system, the latter now being understood by many biologists to be one and the same as the meridian system. So isn't it wonderful, you know, how our modern day science is now validating much of ancient wisdom when it comes to sound healing. I really love this thought. Coming on now to how does this work? Well, here you see a reflex a reflexology uh, chart. And by the way, I just as an aside here in in Egypt, you know, I, I my daddy and I traveled in Egypt many times and uh, at a place called Beni Hassan, we saw tombs with beautiful reliefs and one of those reliefs was showing reflexology literally thousands of years ago <laughs> you know it's really amazing anyway so using the principles of the ancient art of reflexology the ami 850 device uses what i would term as sonopuncture to address all of the major organs so this is a little bit like acupuncture but now literally using sound on these meridians and there i'm just mentioning the, the, again the discovery uh, by the Niels Bohr Institute in 2005, which, you know, I mentioned earlier, so we don't need to labor that now, but just to say again, to underline our nerves conduct sound vibrations from our environment into all the organs of the body. And in this case, of course, right from the, all the nociceptors in the feet, right up into all of the organs of our body. And then of course, again, underlining that electricity is used by the brain to interpret the body signals and that electricity is created by the liquid crystal piezoelectric properties of our nerves and these facts form the basis of the operating principle of the ami 850 device and indeed all the other examples of constructive sound therapy devices that you are that you will be familiar with yourself so now <laughs> One more slide before uh, I hand over to our dear friends and colleagues, Anders and Kachina. And this concerns the discovery of, uh, my discovery, I should say, of acoustic heterodyning. Uh, again, it sounds, you know, quite a, quite a fancy term, but actually it's quite simple when you understand the principles. So this discovery, as with my discovery of the mechanism that had left me pain-free in Egypt's Great Pyramid, occurred accidentally and in this case it was due to my well just my curiosity actually wishing to see a spectrum analysis of the dream of the blue whale music and let me explain why i was interested in that you know i'm particularly interested in all the studies that are showing that the vagus nerve when it is stimulated optimally and, and by optimally, I mean very, very low frequencies in the range 5 hertz to 10 hertz. That's what the research is showing. When the, when the, um, when the vagus nerve leads the brain stem, the first place it branches off to is the tragus of the ears. You know, if I point now, this is this little, uh, little flap of tissue that overhangs my auditory canal and yours, <laughs> right? And this is really wonderful and convenient, right? Because it means that we can easily access the the vagus nerve to stimulate it, right? From the from the tragus of the ears, by the way, it then goes down to the pharynx and the larynx before then branching off to all the other major organs of the body. 
And this is good news as well, because it means that the, obviously the larynx is our means of creating sound vocally, uh, whether we're singing or humming or, or even speaking. And that is actually helping. All of that is helping to stimulate our vagus nerve. But, but when you stimulate it optimally through uh, ear headphones in this case, full ear headphones, not those little, not those little buds that they wouldn't, they wouldn't optimally stimulate your tragus of your ears. But when you use full ear headphones and you can stimulate your vagus nerve optimally, then a whole range of medical benefits become available. And one of them is a mediation of chronic inflammation. Now, there are millions and millions of people all over the world suffering from chronic inflammation and the pain that goes with it, by the way. And yet here is a simple way. You know, this was not my discovery. I'm not I'm referring now to researchers who have discovered that that stimulating the vagus nerve balances the cytokines in your bloodstream that have gone out of balance, causing the chronic inflammation. And yet here is a simple mechanism by stimulating the vagus nerve, the cytokines can slowly come back into balance over a period of a few weeks and the chronic inflammation will simply vanish basically and the pain that goes with it. Other researchers have found that optimal vagus nerve stimulation slows the rate at which we age, um, massively helps cancer prognosis and even uh, provides a sexual boost as well. So, you know, there are many, many benefits that come from vagus, optimal vagus nerve stimulation. And, uh, and so this is why I was so excited now coming on to the discovery of acoustic heterodyning. Why? You know, because to, to, uh, to, to know that music can actually provide us with these very, very low frequencies. In other words, we can wear headphones, we can listen to beautiful music while being healed. You know, how wonderful is that? And this is why, of course, I'm so excited uh, about it and to share that with you all now. So what happened was, you know, Anders and Kachina, dear friends, as I mentioned, and colleagues, and, um, and we have their album, we have several of their albums, but one of them in particular is called The Dream of the Blue Whale. And we very, Annalise and I, very often listen to it at breakfast time. It's so beautiful as we're sitting, having our breakfast, just kind of washes over us. And it's like a kind of balm, you know, for the soul. Anyway, uh, I, I knew, of course, that Anders had this beautiful, deep, rich voice. And I was just interested to know, okay, well, maybe there's a subharmonic or something, you know, of Anders' deep voice sounds that might help vagus nerve stimulation. That was the idea that I had. And I had a, even had a conversation with with Anders and, uh, you know, I said, OK, what's what's the lowest note that you think you can make? And he said, well, on a good day, probably down to about 60 hertz. Right. So obviously nowhere near the five and ten hertz that were needed for optimal vagus nerve stimulation. So what all I did was to take that album and look at it on our lab spectrum analyzer. And oh my goodness, I was absolutely stunned when I saw the results because the analyzer, the lowest band on the analyzer is 12 hertz band, right? And it was dancing up and down beautifully with Anders' voice and not only with Anders' voice, but also with Kachina's keyboards dancing up and down, you know, because there are moments on that album where Anders stops singing and the keyboards come in, you know, separately and vice versa. And yet, and each occasion, each occasion, I was seeing this 12 hertz band. And the other thing, of course, to do with this is that knowing that when you see the 12 hertz band dance up and down, it, because of the shape of the filter curve, it means that there will be frequencies as low as four and five hertz present, ideal for vagus nerve stimulation. So then I excitedly went up into back up into our home where we have a quite an eclectic collection of CDs. We have very you know broad taste with CDs. And I brought a whole bunch down into the lab here and tested many different albums. But the amazing thing was that not every album showed this effect. Some had it, some didn't. 
And to be honest, you know, I still haven't got to the bottom of why exactly this effect happens. But what's happening is that the frequencies, the higher frequencies are mixing together. And this is called heterodyning, mixing together and creating these new lower frequencies. And by the way, some higher ones, too. But it's the lower ones that obviously we are, you know, particularly interested in here because, of course, these low frequencies can stimulate our vagus nerve optimally and create all these wonderful healing benefits so that's why i'm excited about it i'm excited to share this discovery with you all and with the world indeed you know uh, in the not too distant future and of course we are, i'm really interested to to get to the bottom of you know how does this work why are certain uh, albums able to produce these low frequencies very low frequencies they're called the extremely low frequency band, by the way, ELF band of the, uh, or in this case of um, albums that we are listening to. So anyway, it's very exciting. And um, with that, what I'd really like to do now is just to very briefly show you a video of the dream of the blue whale. And if you look to the left hand side of the video where you see all these little bands dancing up and down, the very extreme left hand side of the analyzer is where the this 12 hertz band is showing the energy uh, from the in this case the dream of the blue whale so have a quick look at this now and then I will introduce you to my dear friends and colleagues Anders and Kachina. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, that was obviously Anders voice alone. And uh, because he did, he did send me that, that you know, separate file. <clears throat> um, but, but actually, you know, when I listened to the whole album, um, I was seeing exactly those same effects just in that particular instance, it was purely Anders voice and not the, you know, Kachina's keyboards. Anyway, now it's my great pleasure to welcome our dear friends Anders and Kachina. And uh, instead of all the the cerebral aspects of this presentation. Now we're going to be immersed in the beauty, the great beauty of their music. So welcome, Anders and Kachina. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you. Hi and hi, everyone. <laughs> yes, it's a it's a certainly a great pleasure for us to to be with with you and with you all. And uh, Kachina and I, we are indeed we are honored that that our music, in this case, the Dream of the Blue Whale, has opened a portal. Uh, to a wonderful new healing potential for people and we are actually we are delighted that we can perform for you live now the very music that that so inspired you John in in your research and the dream of the blue whale is originally a piece that is 40 minutes long but for, for today we're going to do a short version so you can just so you can feel the energy for for yourself so I think without further ado, we would just say, please enjoy.
Oh gosh, that was just so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. As always, you know, just gorgeous, gorgeous music. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, that was an incredible experiential bath of healing music that really anchors in what you've been sharing for this whole last hour, John. And really, I, I feel like my, our minds have been blown, our hearts have been opened, our cells have been saturated with beautiful frequencies and now i think is a great time to talk about how do people move forward from this and and one of the best ways in my mind is to actually explore deeper with you john and we are so blessed that you have created a a program for doing that and this is a sort of a 2.0 version of a very popular program that you have uh taught before and it's going to be live and it's going to be so exciting so Let's talk a little bit about that. This program is called Explore the Secrets of Sonic Science and Cymatics, Musical Medicine for Radiant Healing. You can find it on, at the URL musicasmedicinecourse.com, musicasmedicinecourse.com. 
It's a seven week program and you are going to have your paradigm of sound and healing totally opened in magical new ways. And John, I'd love for you to, in your own words, talk a little bit about the high level of where you're going to be taking people over the, over the course of this journey. And then I'll read out the module titles and you can give a preview of what you're doing in each. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Well, you know, from my perspective, um, well, I know that, you know, interestingly here that uh, the Shift Network were a little bit kind of mm, not sure about the science aspect, you know, when I first uh, started chatting with you, Stephen, but, but actually it turned out that the thousands of people actually are extremely excited about learning the science. Mm. Well, module one, the power of sound in the early universe and Earth's primordial oceans for creating life. Yeah, module one focuses on the creative power of sound and in particular how sound in the early universe organized the matter that later evolved into stars and galaxies. And the other main focus of this module is abiogenesis, the hypothesis of how life was formed by sound in the early oceans of the Earth. And of course, discussing the important point since sound was a potent force in the early universe and in creating life this points us quite naturally to sound's ability to heal life. Module two, rediscovering the art and science of sound for healing ancient times to the 21st century. Yes, in module two, we'll explore how ancient cultures used the power of sound to heal, including the aboriginals of Australia, the ancient Egyptians in their various sanatoria and in pyramid initiation rituals, also by Pythagoras in ancient Greece and of course the, the ancient Vedas of India will also dip into the rich history of sound therapies in the 20th and 21st centuries and learn the elements of destructive and constructive sound principles with a particular focus on healing. Module three, wave goodbye to sound waves, how sound gives birth to light for cell to cell communication. <laughs> Yeah, well, in module three, we're going to discuss how the term sound wave is misunderstood and represents the true nature of sound, in addition to its importance in understanding its relation to sound therapy and music medicine. And we'll also discuss the scientific principles that underpin the healing power of vocal sound and the role of intention in self-healing. Module four, the magic of cymatics, how sound is made visible and activates your healing mechanisms. Uh, my favorite subject. So module four, we're gonna delve deeply into cymatic principles, beginning with a fascinating history of the early pioneers, Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo Galilei, Robert Hooke, Michael Faraday, Ernst Cladney, Mary D. Waller, Margaret Watts Hughes and Hans Yeni. And we'll also experience live cymatics demonstrations and discuss cymatic patterns on your cell membranes, gently massaging the integral membrane proteins, awakening cells that are in the sleeping state, thereby rebalancing the body's systems. Module five, pain, what it is and how it can be mediated by sound and music. Such an important module. So module five, our first focus will be on pain what it is and how it can be mediated or indeed totally eradicated by sound frequencies and music. There'll be a deep discussion concerning the different categories of pain and the biological mechanisms that underpin pain, spasm and inflammation, as well as their mediation by sound frequencies. And we'll discuss the amazing discovery by the Niels Bohr Institute that nerves primary role is to conduct sound and the potential for total eradication of cancer by sound. Module six, a deeper dive into sound therapy, music therapy and music medicine to support profound healing. Yes, and module six, well, it begins with a deeper dive into sound therapy, music therapy and music medicine exploring the differences between these therapeutic modalities to expand the knowledge base of participants into these three methods of applying sound and music for healing. We'll also discuss the differences between therapeutic ultrasound, therapeutic infrasound and therapeutic audible sound and it will help participants to understand the frequency ranges used in these different modalities and provide a scientific overview 
of traditional sound devices such as the didgeridoo, Tibetan bowls, crystal bowls, gongs, harps, drums, and of course the piano. And finally, module seven, the biological and healing mechanisms of sound and music in mind, body, and spirit. Yeah, thank you. Module seven, well, having acquired a broad range of knowledge of sound principles and cymatics, in module seven, it's time to take a deep dive into some of the most important biological mechanisms by which sound and music support healing. Key topics in this module include a close look at the vagus nerve and the many health benefits derived from its sonic stimulation. Most importantly, reduction of chronic inflammation, as I mentioned earlier, associated pain, how it can slow the rate at which we age, how it can improve sexual function. Nitric oxide production in the body will also be explored in depth, including how it can be optimally produced by sound and music. And of course, the many health benefits of this vital molecule will be discussed. It is truly a mind-blowing, amazing program. It really expands the paradigm for healing in such remarkable ways and so many practical benefits. So again, the whole program is laid out in detail at musicasmedicinecourse.com. You're going to have, uh, if you choose to join, you're going to get seven 120-minute live sessions with John. As you can tell from today, he's got a lot to share. It's going to include interactive time, Q&A time. You also get recordings for every session, both video and audio, as well as word-for-word -word transcripts. There'll be weekly explorations for home. There's Facebook community to deepen your experience. And on the page, you'll also see a number of extra bonuses that are quite cool to enhance the value of your journey. There's a video dialogue with John and uh, Sh Shamani Jane. It's called Pain Placebo and Your Body's Ability to Heal Itself. Shamani is a great pioneer in the biofield and frontiers of healing science. There's also an ebook from Margaret Watts Hughes called The Adaphone. Uh, that's a, a part of your bonus package and a final bonus that you get just when you sign up by midnight tonight Pacific time. This is a dialogue between John and Barry Goldstein called Going Deep on Music and Healing. John, you want to share a little bit about that special bonus they get when they sign up today? I really love my my uh, talk with Barry. I mean, oh my goodness, you know, we we had such resonance because, you know, we'd both been engineers in sound for a lifetime really and so we had so many there were so many beautiful twists and turns to our conversation i don't want to you know give spoilers here but just to say that i think you'll really deeply enjoy it and one of the aspects that was so amazing to me was that you know both barry and and myself had witnessed our own father's pass um under the influence of or in the being immersed in beautiful music so that was a really touching you know aspect of our conversation that, that i took away and i will always treasure but anyway it's a wonderful conversation and i know that uh, those of you who are able to watch it you will really love it hmm. that's a great it sounds like a really beautiful extra uh, reason to tune in now and and if you get a sense that this is really uh sparking your curiosity or calling your heart, then you have an extra reason to sign up by midnight, which is that uh, great program with John and Barry Goldstein. So we've kept the investment really accessible. It's a very robust program with 120 minute sessions all for seven weeks, plus the bonuses. It's, and we've, and you, so you can get involved for just three payments of $128 or you save 10% when you pay in full with one payment of 349. The course is going to start November 1st, run Wednesdays at 9 Pacific, noon Eastern, which is also a good time to work in e for uh, Europe as well. But even if you can't make the live times, you can still get the full value with the recordings, the transcripts, and the uh, community as well. And really, it's a lot about just taking in this knowledge, making it yours, and, uh, and putting it into practice. So there's some great testimonials for you multiple thousands of people who go through this um, before. It's an amazing program. It is live. It's right on the leading edge and it is going to be fresh, exciting and, and open your paradigm of what's possible for sound as a vehicle for healing and evolution in your life. So again, you can find all the details at musicasmedicinecourse.com, musicasmedicinecourse.com and you get the special bonus with John and Barry Goldstein when you sign up by midnight tonight. So John, you have you've just really taken us on an amazing adventure for the last uh, last hour and a bit. Um, anything that's still on your heart that you want to share with us uh, for folks who are considering going deeper on this journey with you? 
Well, you know, I just love, I love teaching. This is something that I learned about myself, you know, in recent years. I, I remember, you know, my own parents believing that I would, I would, I should have been a teacher, perhaps. But, you know, I don't have any regrets in that sense, because I, you know, all of the knowledge that I've gained throughout my life, I am now able to share. And, um, and I do think that I, I have a gift if perhaps it was bequeathed to me, I, I think so. Uh, for being able to put some sometimes quite complex subjects into simple everyday language that is really accessible, easy to understand. I do hope you can join me. Mm. Well, thank you, John. And thank you all for joining. What an amazing time we've just had together. And if you're called to go further, you're warmly welcome. Musicismedicinecourse.com and you'll get that special bonus with uh, John and, and Barry Goldstein when you sign up by midnight tonight. So thank you so much. Many blessings.